Let me uh, give a brief introduction, and then we'll dig into the questionings right away. And I'll start on my immediate left, uh, Carla Hayden, who is the uh, Librarian of Congress. And uh, she is, as I said, not only the first woman to be Library of Congress, but the first um, African-American to be Library of Congress, and actually the first librarian to be Library of Congress in over 60 years, right? <laughs> Carla was appointed by President uh, Obama and confirmed by the United States Senate by a fairly large margin by these days, right? So very large margin. Uh, she is, was born in Florida, grew up in, uh, in New York and Chicago, went to Roosevelt University, got her undergraduate degree there, got her master's and PhD at one of my alma maters, the University of Chicago in library science. Uh, she worked at the Chicago Library, then she taught at the University of Pittsburgh in library and information sciences, came back to be the chief uh, librarian at Chicago Public Library, and then went to my hometown of Baltimore, where for 23 years she was the head of the Enoch Pratt Free Library, the CEO, and um, came to this job in 2016. 2016. So, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Carla Hayden. Um, in March of this year, Kaywin Feldman will mark her first year here. Kaywin is uh, an army brat, so she grew up in many different places, is that right? Coast Guard. But... Right, okay. So, uh, but you were born in? Boston. Uh, Boston, right, born in Boston. She did her undergraduate work at University of Michigan in classical archeology, span and then got a master's degree in classical archeology span at University of London, and a, class, and, a, and a master's as well at the University of London in, in art. And then she has been the, running museums at, in Fresno, California, in Memphis, Tennessee, and most recently for 11 years at the Institute of uh, Art in Minneapolis, and uh, came to the National Gallery of Art uh, just about a year ago. And Deborah Rudder. Deborah Rudder is uh, a native of California, although she was actually born in Pennsylvania, but a native of California, grew up in Encino, and uh, she did her undergraduate work at Stanford and majored in music and German, of all things, right? And, uh, then she went to work uh, in Los Angeles for the LA Philharmonic, but also got her MBA at the uh, University of Southern California, and ultimately headed up the uh, Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra. Then for 10 years, the Seattle Orchestra, and then for 10 years, headed the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. You're letting everybody know how old I am. Oh, <laughs> she started her career at nine years old. Um, <laughs> and then uh, was recruited to uh, be the president of the Kennedy Center in 2014? 14. And done a spectacular job uh, in those ensuing five plus years, six years, and uh, all of them have done spectacular jobs. So let me ask you at the beginning, um, why did you want to be a librarian? You could have gone to the private equity, gone to the hedge funds. Why did you want to be a librarian? <laughs> What was the appeal of being a librarian? Well, I'm actually an accidental librarian. When I graduated undergrad, I had a, a major in history and political science, oh. and I was thinking about what I was going to do, and my mom at the time said, why don't you think about getting a job? Yeah. And why you figure that out? And I would go in between job interviews to my favorite place, the Central Library in Chicago. And while I was there, one of my uh, recent graduate uh, colleagues said, hey, Carla, you here for those library jobs? They're hiring anybody. <laughs> and it was anybody, and we still do this in libraries, uh, hire people with undergraduate degrees and introduce them to the okay. profession. And so that's how I okay, came well, over. All right, so but there are a lot of librarian jokes. You must have heard of some of them. I've heard a few. So <laughs> why are they unfair? Well, actually, think about this. We have one of the strongest stereotypes. There are other professions, law, uh, right. Right. that have strong stereotypes. And the librarians, the little ladies, it's a wonderful life. What's that last scene? Jimmy Stewart comes and his wife, and fate worse than death, she's a librarian coming right. out, right? So that's why, because for a while, librarians were similar to teachers. They couldn't be married. It was a profession that educated women could go into. Okay. All right, so were you surprised? You're, you're running the Enoch Pratt Free Library in the great town of Baltimore, 23 years. 
you're minding your own business, and all of a sudden somebody calls you from the White House or the President says, how would you like to be Library of Congress? Were you surprised? And did you say, let me think about it? Or do you say yes right away? Well, I, and this, and I'm sure many people in the audience will realize this, when you consult, you might want to think about having to do what you've consulted about. So when my predecessor, and I was part of it, was the Enoch Bradford Library, but also the State Library from Maryland, so I had some pretty varied experience. And I was part of a group of librarians when my predecessor, Dr. James Billington, announced his retirement. Uh, we were asked, what would you do at the Library of Congress? And I said all these things. And then I got a call that said, would you consider actually being nominated? I was like, OK. OK. <laughs> and you were one of the few people, um, well, let's put it this way, you had a salary at the Enoch Pratt I Library that. <laughs> that was higher than the salary at the Library of Congress. Did that occur to now, you? As being now, a David, I have to pay? say, and uh, this is full disclosure. <laughs> did you, when did you, you tell your mother that? You almost gave my dear mother a heart attack. Oh, when I told her that? When you mentioned that, <laughs> because I hadn't told her that. <laughs> and uh, the first thing she said when I got off the stage was, is he right? <laughs> Well, maybe until so, I made a mistake. Okay. Yeah. But so I should have said you're also you were also the head of the American Library Association. Right. At one President point. of American Library. Um, and you were also head of the American Museum yes. Association, right? Yep. Well, American Alliance of Museums. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So uh, why did you want to get into the art management world, art museum world? Did you want to be an artist, but you didn't have the talent for that, or <laughs> did you? Why did you want to be in this area? Since you've, you've stated, David, I will concur that I do not have artistic talent at all. So that was never an option for me. Um, like um, I, you know, many uh, museum professionals, um, I'm in the business because my parents always took me and my brother to museums. Um, although my brother runs away um, from all museums that he sees. So it worked for me, but not for him. Um, but. It, um, the sort of habit of going to visit uh, museums. My father, being in the Coast Guard, we moved all the time. And so uh, with all of the different cities and travel, we'd always go and, and look at museums, um, although mostly history museums. And um, as you mentioned, I was an archaeologist in college and ended up uh, switching to art history because I was so impacted by the power of art. And I feel really um, passionately about the ability of art to impact people's lives. All right, so you were minding your own business at the uh, Minneapolis Museum um, and Institute of, uh, of Art in Minneapolis. And then you got a call from somebody and saying, would you like to interview to be the head of the National Gallery of Art? Were you interested in this uh, position? Or were you saying, hey, I really like Minneapolis better than Washington? Uh, I um, paused because um, as uh, we discussed, uh, David was on the um, interview committee that, that hired me, um, so he knows the answer to this. Um, I paused because um, uh, nobody in the business, including me, thought that the board of the National Gallery of Art would hire a woman. There are um, the profession now of the largest art museums in America, or the, the, the 125 largest art museums, is almost 50% women but there are only two women at the 38 largest art museums in America. And nobody thought the National Gallery would step forward and hire a woman, and they did. Oh, we did? Um, but uh, you, didn't, you didn't think we were serious because uh, when we were doing the interview, I was looking at my iPhone a little bit, and you kept thinking I wasn't that serious. But we were serious. I always look at my iPhone. OK. But, so um, OK, so um, moving from uh, Minneapolis to here was Pleasurable, hard to do after 11 years there? It was minus 40 in Minneapolis last oh. week. <laughs> Not that hard, okay. Not that hard. All right, so Deborah, uh, you were running the Chicago Symphony for 10 years, and you had recruited one of the greatest conductors in the world there, and um, you were pretty happy in Chicago, as I understand it, I think you were. So um, let me ask you why you decided you would be interested in coming to Washington, D.C and uh, heading the Kennedy Center. And before you answer that, I should also make, ask you to, the same question I've asked the others. Uh, did you want to be a uh, pianist or violinist? You did piano and violin. Did you want to be a performer and just weren't quite at the level that you wanted to be? And why did you get into art, um, arts administration? Well, I think I have a shared experience with uh, Kaywin in that uh, this is what I love to do. 
This was what young girls at my age had the opportunity to do. It was our team sport was to sing in a choir, dance in a dance troupe, uh, be in a theater play, or play in an orchestra. And for those of you who are performers, you know that there's a physical feeling that is so intense and power and addictive for being in an ensemble but I was never gonna be the number one, and I hated practicing the violin. Oh, that's, a, that's a problem. Now, I love pl play, practicing the piano today, but that's a different issue altogether. And, um, uh, but I, I just loved it. It was the only thing I really ever wanted to do. Yes, I was a good student and all of that, but I loved being around music. And I fell into it. It wasn't actually a profession. You couldn't go study arts management at that time. Now you can uh, go get a okay. degree in it. But at that time, it was by happenstance that I fell okay. into it. So um, we had a search person who's in the audience here. Where is she? There she is. Here. OK. <laughs> um, we had somebody, uh, I think we were using uh, Russell Reynolds. Yep. And um, we, uh, uh, you, you were part interviewed. And uh, did you, why did you want the job when you were offered it? Why did, you, why did you even want to interview for this? Well, first of all, I knew Washington was a great place. I have family and friends who'd lived here, I'd visited often. I knew it was a really great place, filled with fascinating people, a uh, beautiful city. But more importantly, coming to the Kennedy Center meant that you could have all of the art forms under one roof, mm -hmm. that we could do work that can't be done literally anywhere else in the world, mm -hmm. because we're all colleagues and we all are working towards one common good across every single art form. At Lincoln Center, you have the theater, you have the dance, uh, the ballet, the dance, you have the opera, you have the orchestra, you have Juilliard, et cetera. But they're all individual organizations. Try right. and get them to collaborate, not so easy. The Kennedy Center, we can do all of that. And it adds up much more okay. than just the individual pieces. So explain to people who don't know, who do you report to? You're the Librarian of Congress, you're appointed by the President. If you're the Librarian of Congress, why doesn't Congress appoint you, actually? What's, what's the reason for that? That started, uh, the Library of Congress was established in 1800, and the first Librarian of Congress was actually a clerk of the Senate. And over time, it was determined that that should be an option for the President to nominate and then have full Senate uh, confirmation. Now, um, historically, when you were appointed uh, a Librarian of Congress, it was more or less a lifetime appointment? Yes, it was. Now they've changed it a bit? Term limits. So when a woman comes along, they change the rules a little bit, right? And it's interesting, I was talking with some, uh, during Black History Month, some African American uh, congressional staff members this, this today, and one of the questions was, was that because you were African American that they right. put the term limits? And no, part of the consulting uh, aspect was the library profession felt that with libraries changing so much and with technology and things that we needed to have a... So it's a, now a 10-year appointment. It's 10-year with, with a renewal. Renewal, right? another 10 years. So, yeah. uh, but who do you report to? Do you have a Congress. board? Congress. You're Congress. So Congress, you have I congressional have. Co com committee? Congressional over oversight committees, Senate and House, okay. and then the appropriators uh, are also oversight as well by appropriating. Okay. All right, so uh, who do you report to? You. No, no. <laughs> no you, have a, you have a board. Uh, yes. We and you might just go through the structure. It's an it's a unusual structure, you might say, small. It's, it's a very unusual structure. I, I do think that we have the smallest art museum board in America. I had 60 trustees in Minneapolis, and I now have five. Uh, so we have five private trustees and then four um, ex officio trustees by virtue of office. And t uh, you and Sharon Rockefeller make up half our board. You're here tonight. Right. So we almost have a quorum. Have a right, okay. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, no minion, but a quorum, yeah, yes. Um, so, um, okay, so uh, who do you report to? Do I have actually have exactly the more complicated version of all of the right. above. So the Kennedy Center was signed into existence by Dwight D. Eisenhower um, with legislation in 1958, and at that time they, they stated that there would be 36 appointed by the President of the United States. So it's a six-year term, and they rotate off unless a president is still in place and, and reappoints. So each of my 36 are appointed by the president of the United States. So we currently have Obama trustees and Trump trustees. Fortunately, David Rubenstein is the chair, 
because he can work all of this. But then on top of that, we have about 23 other ex officio. State, administration, the mayor, the chancellor of schools, the National Park Service. You are my boss, too. You are my boss. Everybody's my boss. You're all my boss. So, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. No. Now, you might. They, they, these all sit on, they all sit on my board. Can you describe yeah. for a moment the history of the Kennedy Center? How come we didn't have it at the beginning of the country and how we actually came to get it eventually? Can you do it? Of course I can do it, but I have you sitting right here yeah. listening to well, me. Go ahead, you can do it better. So George, I learned it from him. George Washington really believed that to be an important city in the world, we needed to have a cultural center. And he, in the design of the city, worked really hard to find an opportunity to have a cultural center or at least a performing arts center of some sort. A lot of other things were going on. The original plan got thrown out, finally established, but no center for the performing arts. So all of those other theaters, Ford's Theater, for, in for instance, came about at that time. So there were a lot of discussions over uh, a long period of time, obviously, until 1958. Um, some near misses, actually, at the beginning of the century, but it was not until 1958 when Eisenhower finally signed it. Fundraising took place for a number of years. John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy were very big and enthusiastic fundraisers on behalf of the National Cultural Center. The precursor to today's honors took place in November of 1962 with a, a simulcast from Atlanta and Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C. to raise money. And I think they raised, what, $15,000 or something like that. It was pathetic. <laughs> They needed David Rubenstein, clearly. Uh, and then, with the unfortunate passing of John F. Kennedy, Congress asked the family, um, Jackie in particular, how would you like um, him to be remembered? And she said, I would like to have a living memorial, and it would be John, the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. So it's a great story. And we are unique in the world in that we are, first and foremost, a, a living memorial. Uh, a performing arts center, and then that legislation says that we will be the advoc advocate for arts education across our country as well. Oh, so it, it opened in, uh, talk about, it opened in 1971. Opened in 1971, half of the money was raised privately and the half came from right. the federal government. And uh, where did the National Gallery of Art come from? Whose idea was that? Actually, we were born at the genesis of a private citizen, a generous private citizen, Andrew W. Mellon, who, um, when he was Secretary of the Treasury here in Washington, um, spent a lot of time um, looking at art and thinking about art and looking at the National Gallery in London and decided that there should be a National Gallery for the United States. And so he wrote to President Roosevelt in um, 1936, and in 1937 there was a joint appropriation from Congress uh, to found the National Gallery. And um, tragically, um, Mr. Mellon died in 38, so he never saw the building open. We opened in 1941 with the West Building. And our original collection was the 152 works of art that he gave from his own collection, mm. as well as um, the uh, Crest Foundation sort of came in at the last minute. But I marvel at his vision because he built the, um, or designed this giant building of the West Building with the idea that generous Americans would donate more art and that we would have this right. huge, thriving art museum. But it wasn't like that when he started it. Well, I should add that there was a National Gallery of Art in Washington before he came along, but he insisted on having that name, so he took it away from the Smithsonian. Is that right? It, more yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, so they named the, muse the Smithsonian's uh, art museums had, had to take a different name, but okay. So he got the National Gallery of Art and opened that. And the new building, the East Wing, when did that open? Uh, that opened in 1978, right. and in 1999 we opened the Sculpture Garden, making the full okay. campus. So who had the idea for the Library of Congress? The Library of Congress started uh, when the Capitol moved here and in 1800, and it started with 600 law books as a reference tool for Congress. And it grew until about 1812, and the British came. And in fact, during my confirmation uh, visits, I saw the fireplace that the British used and took books from that collection and started the fire in the Capitol. And Thomas Jefferson, uh, at that time, 1814, had retired to Monticello, and he offered his collection 
At that time, it was about 6,000 volumes, a comprehensive collection, the, the largest and the most compre comprehensive collection in the United States at that time. And he sold it to Congress. And that's how the library really got going. Okay, and uh, do you still have those books? We have quite a few of those books. What, there what was another to, fire. What happened to the... Uh, <laughs> there was, was another, another fire, fire in the 1850s okay. and, and that, and so the library has actually been, that original 6,000 volumes has been basically restored. Yeah. And, uh, but the Library of Congress was in the Congress it was up in, until when? It was in until 1897 when a separate building that you now know as the Thomas Jefferson Building was built because in 1870 the Library of Congress became the administrator of the U.S. copyright system. And two copies of everything that was published was available. And that's when the collection really, really grew. So that magnificent building next to the Supreme Court uh, opened around 1897. 1897, what? the first what? federal building to have electricity. So if you visit, you see that most of the light fixtures, they are very proud of light bulbs all and, over. Um, and how, how much? it was built, and I'm reminded, this at every appropriation hearing, somewhat, <laughs> it comes up. It was on time and under budget. And it cost around seven or eight About million. seven or eight million, but it's been called, it was modeled on an Italian uh, palace, a book palace. Right. So you have two other buildings in Washington, what are they? The John Adams building that's right adjacent to the Folger Shakespeare Library. So they outgrew the Jefferson building and in 1939, the Adams building was built and then they outgrew that. And now there's the James Madison building, and that's okay. uh, 1980. Right. So Deborah, buildings. where do you get your money from? Your budget each year is roughly what, and what percentage comes from ticket sales, philanthropy, U.S. government? So many people think that our structure is similar to theirs, but it is a little bit of a hybrid. All of the funding that supports the physical plant of the Kennedy Center, which is the memorial to JFK, is supported through a federal appropriation. And it is about $40 million um, from year to year. Um, the balance of everything else that we do, so we were created by Congress to be a performing arts center and the, all that arts education across the country, and all of that looks and feels just like any private uh, nonprofit. So uh, the funding for all of that, which is about $200, $210 million a year, comes from ticket sales, parking fees, other kinds of fees, earned revenues, and contributed revenues. So we raise about $80 million a year uh, to support operations and activity of the Kennedy Center. Okay, and so if you didn't have Philanthropy, you couldn't operate. No performing arts center could probably operate. Right. In fact, um, if we were any one of those other performing arts centers around the world, uh, in this country, I should say, we would have to raise the money for right. the building. So, in fact, the federal government is making possible all of those other programs right. that we offer. So, um, how does one win a Kennedy Center Honors? So do you, um, do you, uh, if somebody wants to nominate somebody or somebody thinks there's somebody deserving and they want to let you know, how do they, and how do you actually select Actually, it? this is a deep mystery um, that is known publicly. Um, everybody can make a nomination. I got three nominations by email today. Um, we have a public online nomination uh, process. And we have a running list of everybody who's, anybody who has ever been uh, nominated. And we sort of keep track each year how many people. So there are certainly campaigns that we're very aware of from time to time. But what's really great is that we have, um, a, we go out to all of the former honorees and all of the artists who work at the Kennedy Center and ask them to make nominations. So I'll tell you that Sally Field, was on the list through the public process, but about three years ago, Steven Spielberg wrote a Dear Deborah, you really ought to give it to Sally Field. So we knew this, of course, we shared it with it, and we have a selection committee made up of former honorees and a few board members, and we go through the process, talk about it, and it's the worst part of my job. Uh, because you only have five honorees and you got to balance uh, various kinds of things. So We even. have lists that are this long of okay. names and all the instances. And when did it start? 19... It, it, uh, you would ask that question. 1978. It's for 1978. Right. Oh, sorry. I should okay. know this. Um, that was our 42nd. 
we couldn't give away the tickets actually in those days. That's but, right. Uh, it was t it was really tough. That and the Mark Twain Prize. Nobody wanted to come to the shows in the first two, three, four right. years. Now it's hard to get tickets. So, uh, where do you get your money from? Uh, the bulk of it comes from Congress. And uh, do you charge to come into the National Gallery? No, we don't charge admission. We don't charge for exhibitions. We don't charge for lectures, films, concerts. Everything we do is free of charge for the for the public. And we're open 363 days a year. Wow. Okay. So, um, how much does the Congress give you a year? How much? You, what is your budget? Uh, it's also close to 200. Oh. Okay. So. Um, Anybody ever suggested you gave more money if you had ticket sales, or you can't do that, right? That wouldn't be popular, right? No, we would not. Okay. We're going to stay free. Okay. And stay your money comes well, from, from, early from the federal early. government. Uh, so philanthropy is not a major part of your day-to-day -day operating budget. Well, it is. We have a substantial okay. endowment right. um, that has been contributed by generous patrons, and right. um, it provides a lot of the services and right. uh, exhibitions and programs that we do. Okay. And you, money comes pretty much from the federal government. And we Listen. also have a philanthropic uh, okay. effort, and that's right. the National Book Festival right. Literacy Awards. Well, what is the National Book? Explain what oh, the National, National Book, Book Festival, Festival is. Can you explain when that started and what that actually well, is? Well, First Lady uh, Laura Bush actually started it mm -hmm. uh, 20 years ago. To be, this will be the 20th year. She started the Texas Book Festival when she was First Lady of Texas. And when she uh, came here, she talked to my predecessor and said, yes, we will do it. And now the book festival, it's one day, over 150 authors all for all ages and 200,000 people at the Washington Convention Center. All day, just wonderful. Okay, so what is- And free. <laughs> so today, uh, the biggest blockbuster exhibition the National Gallery's ever had, was that the Mona Lisa or something like that? or? Uh, I think it was actually Vermeer. Vermeer, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. that was All right, and so um, if somebody wants to come into a blockbuster exhibition like the Vermeer or other ones you might have, do they, how do they get tickets for that? Do they call you up or how do you, how do, you do that? <laughs> uh, no, actually you can just walk in and um, we there's don't. There's no lines no. anymore? No. Okay, so if you want to go to the Kennedy Center event, what's the, and let's suppose you want to Hamilton, let's suppose Hamilton were to come again. Let's suppose. Uh, um, uh, how do you get tickets to uh, future Hamilton? Actually, um, this is a, a myth that people think it's hard to get tickets to just about anything. And, and even the Kennedy Center honors, uh, while there is definitely a process and those who are closest to us have the first access to it, ultimately everybody has access um, to be able to buy tickets. Okay. We also have programming 365 days a year um, and uh, lots of free programming for families and everybody. Uh, but buying tickets is really not hard at all. We have a fantastic new website. Right. Come and check it out. It's On sale for, what, for Hamilton is next week for, uh, for members, and then uh, I think two weeks later for the general public. And when you have as many performances, we have over 2,000 performances a year. There is almost always an opportunity to be able to get access to a ticket. Well, in the main building of the Kennedy Center, how many theaters are there? In the main building, we have nine stages, nine performance spaces. And then, then now with the reach, we have another 10 spaces. All right. So on any given night, we have five, six, seven spaces going. And you have a free performance every day for somebody. Is that right? Anybody every single day at 6 o'clock, you have a guaranteed Millennium Stage performance. And we haven't missed that in 22 years. Almost missed it once, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I and never missed it. The reach, can you explain what does the reach really add to you that you didn't have before? So uh, the, the Kennedy Center was designed in a period of time by Edward Durrell Stone um, to very traditional theaters, backstage, front of house. And so as you enter the building, you see these beautiful marble walls, but you have no idea what's going on behind the walls. You have to take elevators up to the other theaters. Um, all of the rehearsal rooms that now exist did not exist when it was first created. There's no way of actually having classroom activities or informal sort of black box kind of experiences. So the REACH gives us uh, a really open, sort of transparent way for audiences and artists to engage with one another. All of the rooms have windows, natural light, and are created to be really flexible to whatever the art form, whatever the kind of experience. So your average person who comes is what age, what gender, what's the mix in gender? and. Uh, Racial composition, do you have a 
So um, the, you know, we, we have at the Kennedy Center had a long history of a place for the Washington National Opera, uh, a very robust ballet series. The American Ballet Theater was the first one. The Washington Ballet calls the Kennedy Center home often as well. The National Symphony Orchestra, those big sort of long established uh, organizations, big theater programming. But um, when I came here, in our, in our conversations, we talked about if you're really the National Cultural Center, you should be serving all of America, and you should offer all of the arts in America. So we've added lots and lots of new programming uh, that didn't find its home at the Kennedy Center. So that has really right. dramatically changed the demographics of who we uh, have, see in our theaters at so, this time. So I suggest that we have a hip hop person, right? Yes, you That's did. Right. As and a matter I, of fact, I and I know you did the people, research. Right? So, uh, who is our hip hop advisor? So Q-Tip is our director right. of, is our artistic director yeah. for hip hop, and then we have an administrator right. who helps support his right. ideas. So, how many people a year go to the National Gallery of Art? Around four and a half million. Okay, and um, what's the biggest attraction you have at the National Gallery? Of Art? What do they most want to see? Uh, probably our Leonardo da Vinci painting. We have the only Leonardo in the Western Hemisphere, so the only one. In the, have, how many Leonardos are there um, extant now? Thirty-five. And the only the Metropolitan Museum doesn't have one. Nope, nope. You got to uh, come to nobody. Had, okay, so how did we get this? Yes. Where did it come from? Um, we acquired it um, uh, with uh, funds provided by Elsa Mel and Bruce. And it costs. Five, five million? Or we don't talk about prices. Oh, it, was, it was inexpensive compared to what it would be today, let's say. Okay, so other than that, what, what, what do the people come to most see and you have other than the, 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 the uh, Leonardo? Uh, most people actually, they come to see our permanent collection, not necessarily exhibitions. And, um, and of course, the French Impressionists are always very popular. Our self-portrait by Van Gogh is uh, extremely popular. Uh, but I have to say that um, we are just about to open a new exhibition about um, Degas at the Opera. And it's an exhibition celebrating the 350th anniversary of the Opera in Paris. And um, it's a gorgeous show filled with images of the dancers um, from the ballet. So if you're, you're, you're the director of the, the uh, National Gallery and you say, I think it's a good idea to have an exhibition, can you gin up one in about two or three weeks? How long does it take to gin up? An How long does it take to get the, that done? You know, I think the, the fastest exhibition in my career was um, a, a, an exhibition we did in Minneapolis in eight months um, that was a 10,000 square foot major exhibition. We worked right. with Robert Wilson um, and, and the museum's uh, collection of Chinese art. Normally shows are a um, five year uh, incubation period. And there's an understanding if somebody's having an exhibition, let's say in London, and they want to borrow one of your paintings, you say, well, I guess we don't need it that much. You lend it to them and vice versa. Isn't that kind of, uh, how, how do you control how much you have out and how much you're taking? Yeah, actually, I mean, it, it, it is a complicated process. Um, as you can imagine, it's staff intensive, and we spend a lot of time making sure that anything we lend is of a condition that it's safe to lend it because right. the vibration of travel of airplanes is very difficult for. Well, if you ever lend anything and it comes back, it's like a fake version of it or anything. You don't get, <laughs> you get the, you always get the real version back. No, um, but nothing ever comes back in better condition than it left. Right. So yeah, sure. um, you have to be uh, careful. Uh, okay. But we lend, we lend a lot, and and we take our role as the National Gallery of Art very seriously and do the best we can to lend to museums across the nation so in do, all parts of the country. Now, do you buy more art or do you get more art given to you? Which, which do you get? All museums receive an average of about 80% of their collection comes from donations, hmm. and um, ours is probably okay. even a bit higher than that. And when people are giving large parts of their collection, what is their average age when they're ready to sort of say, <laughs> hey, maybe you might take my collection. Is that uh, 30 or 40 or a little older? It tends to be older. Older. Yes, okay. end of life planning. Okay. So at the State Library of Congress, what is your most valuable book? Uh, the Gutenberg Bible. One of three uh, uh, in vellum. The other two, British Library and the okay. Bibliothèque Nationale. So those are the only So books. how many books do you actually have? We have 171 million items um, on 836 miles of shelving. 
So when you think about from Washington, D.C., and we figured out where that would end, about <laughs> Davenport, Iowa. Right. And would you, and you have, um, let me ask you this, in terms of your books, is everything in English language? No, over half of the collection is in languages other than English, and we collect in 470 languages. languages. And that really came from Thomas Jefferson's uh, library. And you he have comic art. books as well? Or? We have the world's largest collection of comic books. Okay. <laughs> so, the world's um, largest, now you and comic art. Yeah, you have your own uh, award show, too, called uh, the, the Gershwin. The Gershwin Award. All right. So who's going to get it this year? Garth Brooks. Okay. And everybody's excited about that. And it's really in honor of George and Ira Gershwin, who gave their collection to the Library of Congress. Rogers and Hammerstein, we have Leonard Bernstein. Well, it's for songwriters to some yeah. extent. It's for songwriters or performers. Okay. Tony Bennett right. got it. So, Let's suppose um, I wanted to get a library card at the Library of Congress. Can average citizen get a library card? Actually, yes. You can get really? a card, a reader's card. You can't check anything out. The only people who can check things out are members of Congress. Did they bring it back? We keep track. But I mean, <laughs> do, do you find, like, suppose somebody, the Senate Majority Leader, and he doesn't return the books, what do you do? We ask politely, <laughs> very politely, and they are not fined. Oh, no, fines. no fines for members of Congress. No fines for members of Congress. But it's 16, and we're doing more programming with the um, uh, city school system. There's a one-card system that they have right. where you have a metro card and things like that, and we're saying at 16, you can get a reader's card. All right, so lots of times libraries have had people steal rare, rare items. Uh, yes. How do you prevent that from happening? Well, <laughs> well, you can't tell all your secrets because somebody might be listening who wants to steal. <laughs> Thank <But>. you, David. <laughs> But uh, close observation, uh, with that card, you are, the materials are brought to you. And we do keep a pretty close eye. We have a, a very robust security system as well. And the US Capitol Police are also our partners. Hey, there. So are any of you affected yet by the coronavirus? Are people? Actually, uh, our Congressional Research Service, we still are the research arm for Congress. Right. So that, and we have about 400 staff members, all uh, policy experts. And in the last few weeks, they have been working overtime, providing information uh, to Congress. Okay. Yeah. But the attendance is not that affected. That by that we can mm -hmm. tell. We haven't okay. seen a big drop off. And coronavirus hasn't no, affected nothing you. That, no, nothing that we can tell yet. Now, you have a different story. Mm -hmm. The National Symphony Orchestra has long had on their calendar to go to Japan and China starting next week. So three weeks ago, um, uh, it, the China portion of the trip was canceled. Um, it was a tough decision until the day that we were making the decision, and then it was clear that China was closing down. Um, but the orchestra is due to leave a, a week from tomorrow for Japan. And it's still a, a, a conversation right. because they are, still are having performances. Uh, the pianist for the National Symphony is uh, Lambert Orkus, who, is, um, a, who works with Anne-Sophie Mutter, and they are there performing right, right now. Wow, okay, so you'll have to make a decision relatively soon on that. Okay, so today, um, Kennedy Center Honors is probably your biggest draw, hottest ticket. What other things have been like, the most popular that you've had in the last year or two, or is, is it Hamilton is the most popular? What other things have been particularly popular? Well, I'll say uh, just about three weeks ago, we had Diana Ross for three performances. That was 110% sold. Um, thank you for your donated tickets that help get to the 10%. Um, we have had uh, M, uh, we've had really successful hip hop performances, comedy um, outside of the Mark Twain Prize, Hamilton, of course. Uh, we, uh, uh, theater is very, very popular in this city. Hey, now you might explain the Washington National Opera and the National Symphony are kind of owned more or less yep. by the Kennedy Center. Is that yep. right? They're affiliate members of the, of the Kennedy Center, yes. But you're responsible for their budgets and so forth? Right, we have an executive director and a general director for each of those, and they have a separate board, but they are amongst the family, yes. Okay, and today, the biggest challenge you have, other than getting through this interview, uh, what is your biggest challenge? 
and other than the coronavirus? What, what's the biggest thing you have to worry about? Actually, Emma? you know, I think it's probably true for my colleagues and all of my art, artistic administrators who I see here, is really understanding the, the balanced portfolio of what we do. Um, we think about everything we do from what's the, how does it affect our mission, what is the impact on our audiences, and what, how is the financial decision making. Because all of our artists have fantastic ideas, uh, glorious opportunities for us to really present to audiences. But in the end, there's only so much time and resource. And how do you make that? What's the right number? We've expanded significantly in our work around social impact, which is about engaging in local communities and inviting audiences who don't always get to come to the Kennedy Center. But again, how much is the right size? And when you're not doing it based on the pure economic bottom line, it's a harder decision. So, um, Kaylin, what's the biggest challenge you have? I'd say navigating the um, changing audiences now and sort of the balance of what I think of as our loyal traditionalists who enjoy um, the National Gallery or art museums um, in a, a way that they've grown up with. Okay. And then we have this um, new population of um, younger folks who um, represent a greater diversity in America, um, who are born digital, who behave differently. They, they interact with arts organizations in different ways. And balancing those two um, can be quite a challenge. Well, when the National Gallery was set up, it wasn't set up to be an Asian art museum, for example. So you're mostly focused on Western art. Is that fair? European and American, yes. Right. yes, yeah. And that's yeah. not going to change anytime soon, probably? No, no. OK. And uh, how do you be, make certain that you don't have fakes in your forgeries in your collection? Has that ever been a problem? Um, we hire the very best people we can, so our expert curators. Someone's, all right, someone's coming into one of the National Gallery um, galleries. How, do you, how close can they get to the picture before you, you have your guards say, get back? And do you ever have people get too close, or they want to touch something, or they touch an object there, or what do you, do, what do you tell those people? I, I'm sorry to say that that does occasionally happen, yes. Um, uh, when I was in um, actually running a museum in Memphis, we had a school group come in, and um, one of the children had touched a painting on the tour, and so and and the the school group was actually several classes combined. So we called the school, and they had an assembly, and they said, "Okay, one of you touched a painting at the museum. We know who it is because we have it on video. So you better come forward." And twelve kids came forward. Oh. Okay. They're, uh... Go ahead. Little, uh, little George but, Washingtons. Okay, so um, okay, so um, what's your biggest challenge? Uh, making sure that we have this wonderful collection and it's accessible to as many people. We get almost two million people at in-person visits here in D.C. But all of these treasures, the, the baseball cards, the the comic books, all of these Thanks. things, the papers of 23 presidents. So we're digitizing our unique items and trying to make sure that as now much I, as possible. Now, you have a main reading room, a big dome. A it's wonderful a reading Wonderful, room. beautiful building. But I go in there sometimes, I see people like sleeping a little bit. Um, is well, that allowed? Well, it is a library. So you don't, you, don't, you don't push them out or anything? No, no. They could be thinking. Try to do that. Okay. Um, and, it, and the libraries have always been those safe havens for people. Okay. And the Library of Congress is similar in that sense. So okay. you will see people, but you also will see uh, younger digital natives with their headphones on, and they are in that space as a cool place to get on their laptops and do right. different things. So how do we engage with them? How do we make sure that when they Google something or bring up something, our resources are you know, our primary resources? So, so I mentioned all of you were the first women who've held your jobs, but let's go back in your career. Was it difficult to be a woman in that particular business, uh, running symphonies? Was that very common when you were starting out or not? There weren't very many women running orchestras for a period of time. But there have always been a lot of women in the arts business. 
Hey, what about in the arts world? You said earlier there weren't that many women uh, running art museums. Is that changed, changing or it's not so much? changed substantially. So in the 26 years I've been a director, I think when I started, it was like 8% of the business was uh, made up of women, and now it's right. 50. So big change in 26 yeah. years. Hey, so, and what about you? You had the double discrimination. A right, about. person of color, and then being in one of the four feminized professions, social work, nursing, uh, education and librarianship where 85 to 90 percent of the workforce is female and the top management didn't reflect that. Really? And so okay. that's really... They look like me, right? Probably Quite males, a few. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, Deborah, what would you like the average person to know about the Kennedy Center? Let's suppose somebody's just tuning in now or watching. What, what you know, in one or one paragraph or so, what is the most important some, thing that somebody should know about the Kennedy Center? Um, that the arts are welcome and invited for everybody to participate in, that no matter where you come from, no matter what your interest, there is something at the Kennedy Center that you can participate in, enjoy, and, and have uh, a shared experience with others. All right, what, what should somebody most know about the National Gallery of Art? You know, I, uh, I've spent a lot of my year uh, learning about the history of the gallery and, and thinking about the institution, and um, I'm very struck by the remarkable generosity of Andrew Mellon. And it wasn't just that he conceived of the museum, that he paid for it, right. he gave his collection, but I really believe that um, he wanted all Americans to have the opportunity to experience the very best of human creativity in the most glorious, grand space. Right. And sometimes people want to criticize our buildings as being intimidating. But I, I, I actually think that um, Mr. Mellon intended for, um, in the most generous way, all people to be able to have that experience. And so anyone can walk in any day of the week. Right. And, and, and you're self-directed, so you can wander if you decide you don't like the um, Spanish painting so much, but you really like Dutch painting, you can wander in, on your own and go find the works that speak to you. So what is, why, are, why is museum attendance generally down around the United States, art museums, history museums? Why do you think that is? People just sit at home more, or why, are museum atten why is museum attendance somewhat down? It does depend on, um, of, of course, uh, the museum and, and the region. Um, but I do think that it's, um, a sort of saturation of things to do. When you uh, talk to a millennial, for example, about a cultural activity, they will mention going to the park, um, going out to dinner, um, going to a film is a cultural activity. Right, okay. And so there's a lot more competition now for leisure time than there was uh, 30 years ago. Deborah, why are performing arts important to our country? Why, why should we really care about the performing arts? Because you know it's not STEM and you know, we have to compete against the Chinese, and we have to be engineers. Why, why do we care about performing arts? Well, there are a lot of different reasons, not the least of which is that just as we are having this experience, we're sharing an experience here together. Coming together to experience something brings uh, a sense of humanizing of who we are and understanding. In the case of the performing arts, I really believe that our artists are really holding a mirror up to who we are as, as, it, as a society. They're telling our story, and that's why people are so interested in coming and having that experience. It's also a place where you can sort of go deep into yourself, a little bit of reflection, meditation even, uh, when you go to a performance. But it also takes you into another place that you have sort of discovered another part of who you are uh, as a human being, but you did it side by side with others. So the living experience of right. being in a room and sharing it with others. What's really fascinating, I was talking to a handful of teachers last week and all of them said, it is so important for our children to have the opportunity to study the performing arts and experience it, not because they are different learners, but because it teaches them about collaboration, it teaches them about creativity and innovation, and it gives so much confidence to young people when they have the opportunity to be successful and share it with others. So there are all these different kinds of benefits that come from participating in and experiencing a so, live performance. Uh, teaching them about cooperation, so a lot of members of Congress presumably were putting in performing arts students when they were younger, right? I actually believe that there's great value in that. So um, if somebody says, all right, Deborah, I've listened to you, 
Um, I want to help the Kennedy Center. I'd like to be a supporter. Do you want any supporters who might give you time or, or money or anything like that, or you got enough of that? Right. <laughs> this is why we love David Rubenstein, right. of course. So, you know, you can be a member for $75, and for $75, you can hear from me every week, or more often, perhaps, right? Um, uh, but it gives you an access point of knowing what's going on at the center. But we have volunteers who do everything from being docents, to helping uh, actually engage. Ian Jefferson is here, and he's one of our really active vo volunteers through his expertise giving back to the Kennedy Center. And then, of course, we have everything all the way up to David Rubenstein in terms of philanthropy in, the, in this community so and around the country. Somebody wants to be a supporter of the National Gallery of Art, what, what can they do? Can they give you money, volunteer, Same thing, we always take money, um, absolutely. Uh, we also have lots of volunteers. We have um, docents who take children around on school tours. We have a docents who take okay. adults around. We have um, information desk volunteers. There are lots of ways to get involved. Okay, and what about the Library Say, of Congress? Uh, especially in terms of our special programming, the book festival, and also exhibits. We've been very fortunate, and AARP is here, uh, to have the philanthropic support to have the Rosa Parks exhibit that's right. there now, and women's suffrage. So being able to have You think people are reading support. too many books right now? No. <laughs> yes. They're reading right. quite a bit. Right. And more than okay. you'd think. All right. So this is the Economic Club of Washington. So what is the economic benefit to Washington of the Kennedy Center, for example? Well, you know, when we were closed down in the middle of a strike in Chicago, the people who were the most gung-ho about getting that orchestra back on the stage were all the businesses in the region because they were the ones who actually connected to us and interacted right. with us. So you, don't, you, you think of us as being standalone islands in what we do, but we are working across all of your businesses in this region right. and beyond. All right, the National Gallery, are you contributing to the economic vitality? Absolutely, of and of course, with the whole ecosystem of museums um, in Washington, we um, attract so many um, visitors to the city. And um, I know that in 2016, the economic impact of arts and culture in Washington was 11 billion. So we're part of right. that, that ecosystem. So we have the head of the Hirshhorn is here. Where is she? Right there? Melissa is right, right there. there. Thank you. And um, that is the Hirshhorn. Um, the Hirshhorn, is that part of you or is that separate? And should they, people go just to you or should they go to the Hirshhorn? Or? <laughs> Absolutely. They should go to both of us. The Hirshhorn okay. is a fantastic and important museum, and they are part of the Smithsonian. Okay, and um, we are part of that ecosystem mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Sixty percent of our visitors on site are from other countries and visitors to the Capitol Visitor okay. Center. And there's a tunnel that goes directly from the Capitol Visitor Center to us. So oh, is people there... are coming and extending their stay, and we partner with the Folger and other places to make sure that. Is yeah, there another any, reason to be in the city? Final question. Is there any other job in your profession that you would rather have? Never. Nothing. This is it. What about in your profession? No. no. In your profession? No. Oh. Okay. Well, look, I would say on behalf of everybody who lives here and everybody in the country, you've done a terrific job and are doing a terrific job for our country. So thank you very much. Thank you for doing it.